Mm -hmm. And sharing the screen. Okay. So today we want to uh, solve a atom within LDA, so local density approximation. Uh, so we, we are going to continue with adding interactions to our solution for generic atomic problem. So the, 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 all the difference between the previous hydrogen problem and this problem is that we are going to add this V hard tree plus V exchange correlation potential. And this hard tree and exchange correlation potential are self-consistently determined in the sense that they de then themselves depend on the charge density. So we need to calculate charge density first. Once we have charge density, we need to evaluate V hard tree V exchange correlation. Once we have that, we put it back into the Schrodinger equation and solve this again, and we iterate until self-consistency. So uh, we started this program by um, uh, by uh, calculating. Yeah, so we um, we saw that the form of the Hartree potential is basically just an electrostatic potential, which is rho of R prime divided by R minus R prime, integral over the 3D space. Then we realize that basically solution of such an integral can also be written in terms of uh, in terms of uh, a Poisson equation, uh, namely nabla square on R3 is minus eight pi rho of R. Uh, the reason that this can be done is because this potential is basically just a, a classical electrostatic potential of this form. And then uh, in because we have um, spherical symmetry in this case, we can uh, uh, write everything in terms of uh, spherical uh, r, uh, spherical distance r, and then the Poisson equation looks very simple. So the second derivative of u is just uh, proportional to the charge density r. Uh, and uh, and basically this is when we use uh, when we use a function u rather than v Hartree. So basically we introduce new variable, we have through R times R, which is called U. And when we write equation in terms of U, it has the simple form. And then we said that we're gonna, we're gonna solve this second order differential equation with all the int from, uh, from SkyPy. Um, and in order to use that, we need to have charge density rho uh, given for any, uh, any point in space, any R. So if uh, uh, when the user needs uh, uh, charge density at point R, we should be able to evaluate charge density at this particular point, okay? So in order to do that, so this is the this is requirement uh, for all the int because all the int should be able to calculate the second order derivative with arbitrary point R, doesn't it? So um, th therefore, uh, what we had to do is we had to spline uh, obtain charge density rho uh, on uh, a mesh in which we calculated it first. So we spline it, and then once we have a spline, we can of course evaluate uh, charge density in any other point, at least approximation for this charge density in any other point. And that's exactly what we've done. So uh, we um, uh, first, uh, we have charge density rho from the hydrogenic like solution, charge density rho, then we use SkyPy function uh, univariate spline, which uh, can spline uh, um, uh, 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 data uh, given by rho uh, in such a way that that spline goes exactly through the points uh, on uh, in the data set. So data set is is given by R and rho. And when we set this S is equal to zero, means that we are forcing the spline to go exactly through all the data points, okay? And the uh, resulting spline is called rho spline. And then we give this rho spline to uh, this function for heart rate. So function for heart rate is defined over here, uh, which takes uh, the, the first two uh, variables are fixed by uh, all the int um, uh, requirement. So all the int uh, requires first to be dependent variable. The first variable should be dependent variable. The next variable should be independent variable, and then arbitrary set of extra variables. In this case, arbitrary uh, the set of extra variables is just Ross spline, which we need to give through this arcs uh, uh, arcs uh, parameters. 
Okay. So um, now this line here uh, calculates, uh, uh, basically evaluates this, this um, solution for the uh, Poisson equation with the initial condition that the value at zero is zero and the derivative at zero is some arbitrary number, which we set here at, at one half. So once this um, uh, uh, integration by all the int is done, we take, uh, we take uh, the first component only because uh, the, we set the second order differential equation into the two first order differential equations with two components. The first component is u itself and the second component is the derivative of u. So therefore we take only the first component here. Um, and uh, then we, uh, we need to add to this particular solution uh, solution of the homogeneous equation in such a way that the uh, that the solution will satisfy both boundary conditions and the boundary conditions are that u of zero is zero and u with infinity is 2z so we as we discussed this two boundary conditions can be satisfied by adding an arbitrary uh, arbitrary solution of the homogeneous part of the differential equation. And the homogeneous part of the differential equation uh, is solved by arbitrary uh, arbitrary line, uh, alpha times r. And this alpha can be, uh, can be calculated from the large r limit. And that's exactly what we do here. So we take the large r limit, we have to evaluate 2z minus the value of this u in infinity divided by r in infinity. So we evaluate this alpha, we add this uh, this uh, uh, homogeneous solution to our particular solution. And as we see at the end, of the, once this is done, we see that our solution satisfies properly the, uh, the, the, the uh, condition that at large r, it goes to the right constant and at small r is equal to zero. So we see that this solution does satisfy properly both boundary conditions. So it's correct solution for our problem. Now, the uh, next step that we want to do here is we want to uh, remove the need to do to make spline first and then use all the int, uh, um, uh, all the int uh, method to integrate. The, the problem is that splining a function and then evaluating it at arbitrary point is already um, uh, time consuming and not very precise, uh, uh, not very precise method. It gives you an error. So we want to avoid this error. And second, we know that this all the int here being general purpose um, uh, solver for differential equation is not very good solver for our particular equation, which is of particular high symmetric form that does not have the first order uh, derivative. So as we discussed last time, if there is no first order derivative, then we can use numero algorithm, which is way more efficient than the generic uh, solver um, for differential equation. And for the Poisson equation, this uh, form is even simpler than for Schrodinger equation because the, uh, uh, the uh, form is very simple. The second derivative of t is just, an, uh, a, generic, is just a function u of t, where u of t is a constant function, isn't it? So for, for Swan equation, this u of t is basically just minus eight pi rho of r, okay? Rho of r is given. So minus eight pi rho of r is this function u of t. Uh, and uh, basically all we need to do is to evaluate this, um, uh, solve this uh, uh, differential equation. And now uh, I'm using um, uh, th this um, uh, iterative algorithm that we derived last time. Uh, for numero, uh, the only difference from last time is that we use that the second order derivative here is not f of uh, f of t times x uh, uh, times x of t, but it's just u of t. So therefore, the second order term is is even simpler. And then uh, this needs to be followed by the fourth order derivative at zero. And the fourth order derivative again we estimate by the second order derivative of the second derivative. 
So the second derivative is u of t. So therefore, the fourth order derivative is the second derivative of the second derivative. And it's given by this simple equation. Uh, now we insert this approximation for the fourth order derivative back into the uh, this recursive relation for the numeral. And uh, well, we have the following, um, we have the following um, uh, equation. So we just need to iterate this equation uh, n times through all the mesh points. Now uh, we're going to do the same trick as before. We're going we're going to introduce a new variable w, which is x minus h square over twelve minus u. And you can see that if you uh, indeed put, uh, in, if you um, move those terms with u on the left hand side, the x and, and h square over 12 times u will uh, exactly subtract each other. And therefore, w will have an extremely simple, um, uh, uh, simple equation, uh, iterative equation, as that. So the W has this extremely simple iterative equation, WI plus one minus two WI plus WI minus one is, is just H square times UI. And then once we have the W, we can calculate X out of W. So the algorithm is very simple. We iterate W with this um, uh, iterative form. And then uh, at each iteration, we calculate X from W uh, and we also calculate W from X. Okay, so uh, now we uh, need to implement this numero algorithm, and I call called it numero UP because it's numero for the particular form uh, of the uh, of the Poisson equation. Uh, so the input is uh, this uh, function U, which is the Right hand side of x double prime. Uh, then x zero is the initial condition uh, for the value. dx is initial condition for the derivative, and dh is the small step, isn't it? Is the small step on the mesh. Uh, and basically, the algorithm is very simple. So one thing that I'm using here is this uh, JIT, which uh, speeds up the code a lot, um, as we discussed. Uh, Last time, this is the Numba um, a trick that uh, if you don't have any complicated uh, data structures in your code, you can use Numba to su substantially speed up Python code. And indeed, the speed of this Python code is almost as fast as the C code. So that's uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big improvement. Um, and otherwise, you would need to code this in Fortran or C. But with Numba, it's pretty good. So um, yeah, the implementation, again, I'm not going to walk you through every step. But the most important step is, is of course, this, uh, this iteration. So w2 is, so this iteration is basically this thing. So w2 is 2w1 minus w0 plus h squared times u, isn't it? So th this is, this is the, 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 main, uh, the main part of the implementation. And then we. Uh, uh, we do exactly the same as the, the other numero algorithm uh, to, to iterate through all the data points. Okay, so we have now uh, numero in, in, in um, implementation for Poisson equation. And uh, then all we need to do is to give this function u. And as I explained before, function u is basically given by minus 8 pi r times rho of r, OK? So this is our function u that needs to be given to numeral algorithm, OK? So rho has to be given. r is the independent variable. It's the mesh points that we have from the very beginning. One thing that you need to take in uh, uh, ha have in mind is that this um, mesh has to be linear. It cannot be logarithmic, for example has to be linear because this is what uh, numero algorithm requires. But currently, we do have a linear mesh. Uh, so then we just evaluate this, uh, um, this function uh, minus 8 pi r times rho of r. Because as we know, this, is, this appears on the right-hand side uh, of the Poisson equation, minus 8 pi r rho of r. Uh, and then. Uh, 
we give some arbitrary value for the derivative, the value uh, of u is zero is zero, the derivative is arbitrary, uh, and then the distance between the mesh points is r1 minus r0. Okay, then once we get the solution of this, we properly, uh, we subtract the proper uh, uh, homogeneous solution, and we are supposed to get a correct um, uh, correct solution of the Poisson equation. And uh, so now U2 in this case should be very, very similar to original U0 that was obtained by, uh, by uh, Odeint. And now we plot both the U0, which was obtained above with Odeint, and we also plot U2, which was now obtained by, uh, by Numero, and we see that they are basically on top of each other, okay? But the point is U2 is first more precise and second uh, is also much faster. So therefore it makes sense to use numero algorithm for this, for this problem. Okay, so now that we have more precise, uh, uh, more precise um, uh, solution of the uh, Poisson equation, we can um, add this to our um, Schrodinger equation. But before we do that, we are going to uh, pack together everything that we learned up to now into a function, which we're going to call hard through u, because this function will then be used later on in the self consistent loop. OK, so uh, hard through u is a simple function that does exactly what we uh, what we uh, have done up to now. So given the given the um, mesh R charge input charge density rho, and z of the atom, it calculates as an output the uh, Hartree potential. Actually, it's, it's Hartree potential times r. Okay, so uh, if you uh, if you're a good programmer, you should definitely uh, write some comment here, isn't it? So it should say given uh, input uh, uh, charge charge density. Uh, it returns um, heart rate potential in the form V heart rate of R times R. Is that? So um, we evaluate this. So we're going to have it up to now. And then uh, we are going to test once more that it works. So we, we just now execute this heart rate U on current charge density rho, and we get the same plot as we got before. Okay, so this is a step one. Now, step two is we need to uh, add also the exchange correlation potential. So we have now the Hartree potential in order to um, uh, do the so-called local density approximation, we also need exchange correlation potential. So now how do we calculate exchange correlation potential? Well, the prescription is here. This is so-called local approximation. So if we know rho in each point in space, then we have a one-dimensional function, the exchange correlation, that takes as an input charge density and gives you output exchange correlation for this point in space. That's what this, this function says, okay? So all we need to have, all we need is one-dimensional function, which gives you for a number, which is called charge density, exchange correlation potential. Okay, so um, now how do we get that? Well, um, we are just going to use implemented uh, formulas. Okay, now the, the implementation is um, given uh, here in uh, uh, online, so in uh, packed in X, X core uh, exchange correlation object. Okay. Um, probably when you downloaded the full thing, it, it was already in this directory, so probably you don't need to do anything, but we're going to look into it a little bit. So it's a little Python, uh, Python class. Um, and so what it, it's a class, so basically we can instantiate it by uh, calling this exchange correlation. So this is, we'll instantiate the class. As you see, this is a class exchange correlation object. Um, and, um, so then we are going to use it like this. So uh, V E X is um, potential exchange potential, and V C 
is the correlation potential. But what this, uh, uh, these two functions need is basically not charge density, but rather RS, okay, RS. RS is something that uh, is very, very commonly used for this potentials because it's a natural variable in homogeneous electron gas problem. As I, as I explained uh, last time, uh, all these parameterizations for um, exchange correlation potentials are typically uh, based or obtained from uh, uh, uniform electron gas problem. And in uniform electron gas problem, we almost never talk about density. We almost always talk about RS. Now, but the two are uh, connected very simply. I mean, there is a very simple relation between the two. Namely, RS is a typical distance between two electrons at charge density rho. Okay, so how do you see that? Well, you see from this expression, isn't it? So if uh, RS is four pi rho divided by three to the power of minus one third, that means that, uh, that one over charge density is exactly the volume of uh, a little sphere of size RS, isn't it? Okay, so the volume of the little sphere uh, is four pi RS to the three divided by three, which is exactly one over the charge density, isn't it? It's a typical volume of, of an electron. So there is a very simple relation then between rho and between RS. So once we have RS, we can give this to this V exchange uh, and V correlation potential in the, in the Python script. And we are gonna get out uh, the proper, uh, uh, proper potentials. Now, one thing that we need to, we need to be careful is that this implementations, implementation of the, uh, of, the, um, uh, of the exchange correlation potential and, and energy is usually in Hartree's. In this case, it's given in Hartree's, not in Rydberg's. So therefore we need to multiply it by factor of two because there is a factor of two between the two units. So Rydberg's is a smaller unit than Hartree, okay? Hartree is twice as big unit than Rydberg. So therefore, unfortunately, we need to add this factor of two. Okay, so um, yeah, if we look in, into this exchange correlation, um, object once more, we see that it's relatively simple. So it has several types of parameterizations uh, up between zero and four. I think we're gonna use parameterization three, but basically these are just different functional forms that are fits to the published Monte Carlo data. So um, back in history in 1970s, um, a group used uh, um, diffusion Monte Carlo to calculate uh, relatively precise, not exact, but relatively precise uh, uh, energies uh, of the GLEO model. And then several authors uh, decided to fit this curve with various uh, approximate forms through the data points. And so these are just really fits and we don't need to know exactly how they look like. Uh, if you if you see a typical example, it has uh, it has some logarithms in there, and it has some arcostangents and so on. So some analytic functions with which this was uh, this was um, uh, fitted. Actually, the the starting point of all those fits is usually uh, is usually uh, a, a rational form for uh, I think for exchange correlation potential, and then you integrate this rational form and you get various logarithms and arcostangents uh, 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 for, for the energy density. But again, this is irrelevant for us. What's important is that these are, this is relatively simple one dimensional function that given uh, RS, you get out uh, this uh, uh, potential, okay? So um, now how we're gonna use it? Well, uh, first we are gonna import uh, from this X core. So X core is the name of the module. Uh, from this X core, we are gonna import this class exchange correlation. Okay, so we are importing just one uh, class exchange correlation from this, uh, from this module. Uh, and then we are, we are instantiating uh, 
the, uh, the class, which we're going to call EXT. So this is the now uh, uh, instance of this class. Then uh, we can start using this EXT uh, down here. Uh, and then even before that, we're going to write a simple function that, uh, that translates from raw into RS. And as, as we know that the relation between the two is very simple. So it's given here. RS is basically four pi rho divided by three to the power of uh, minus one third, which is implemented here. The uh, one thing that one needs to be careful, it's um, this uh, minus one third uh, many times uh, leads, to, uh, leads to overflow. It's actually very, very easy to get overflow. Why? Because the charge density rho uh, at very large distances tends to be extremely small. So it's not unusual for charge density rho to be 10 to the minus 100 at large distance. You know that we integrate this to the very, very, uh, to very, very large r. Actually, we start at large r and we set the rho to zero at the very end. Okay. So rho actually has one data point in which it's exactly zero. So if you then evaluate rs from such a rho, you're going to get none. Isn't that? Which which is something we want to uh, avoid. So therefore, we're going to say if rho is smaller than some number, like 10 to the minus 100, then uh, rs is, uh, is a large number. It's not infinite, but it's a very large number. And so for practical purposes, of course, such, uh, such rho is, uh, is, uh, is just very large, uh, which I think will, will give us at very large rho, the exchange and correlation energy actually go, vanishes. Okay, so this is just a way to avoid numerical problems. Okay, so once we define this RS, um, we can now finally go over all data points in row. So uh, this uh, uh, for loop iterates uh, over all data points in row for RH in row and evaluates then first evaluates RS on each point, RS on each uh, data point, and then uh, gives RS to the uh, this exchange correlation class, and evaluates both pot uh, exchange um, potential and correlation potential. Now, this factor of two here in front is because of the units, as we discussed before. The uh, units in the module are given in terms of Hartree, and we need things in terms of Rydberg units. Okay. So this expression will now give us the exchange correlation potential on this mesh on which the, the density is calculated, isn't it? So this simple line will give us the exchange correlation potential. Uh, now, once we have exchange correlation potential, we will calculate um, a construction which we're gonna call it consham, consham potential, okay? Now, let me explain what consham potential is. Um, well, the Schrodinger equation uh, in the presence of heart rate and exchange correlation potential has this form, okay? So we've seen this form before, uh, except that there's a little problem here. It shouldn't be equal to zero because I've set these things on the right-hand side, okay? So it should be like that. Um, so this is the form of the Schrodinger equation. Okay, um, when we have the hard and exchange correlation potential. Okay, in hydrogen atom, there are only first two terms. Now we need to add the, the second two terms. Now, um, it's convenient to, uh, to work in terms, of, uh, in terms of this U rather than V. Now, namely, it's convenient to call this construction here, the, the, this, this three terms together, as u consham. So basically, u consham is u heart three minus 2z plus r times v exchange correlation. Okay, so it's convenient to work with this function, then divide by r before you insert this into the heart potential. Okay, so we're going to work with this construct. Why? Because at large r, u heart three minus 2z goes to zero is that because we know the boundary condition of u heart rate is 2z so we subtract 2z goes to zero and it's small r this might, must go to minus 2z okay 
So, um, so this quantity, let's 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 check this quantity. Okay, and we plot this quantity, and we see that at small r indeed has to go to uh, well, we we are plotting now minus u divided by minus u k s divided by two, which at small z has to go. At small r has to go to z, and at large r has to go to zero. Okay, so it seems to have the right form. Okay, now once we have this um, a potential, which is the combination of Hartree potential, uh, exchange correlation potential, and uh, interaction with the nucleo nucleus, uh, then we can use this uh, to solve Schrodinger equation once more with better estimation for those potentials, those self-consistent potentials. So, and that's what we're gonna do, do now. Um, so we are gonna, in order to do that, of course, we're gonna use numeral algorithm again, uh, and numeral algorithm needs uh, this um, function f Schrodinger, which needs to have as an input. Um, uh, no, actually, what does it need to? Well, it, it needs f Schrodinger, which is um, which is this uh, which which calculates this right hand side f function is not that f function which is what needs to be multiplied with u to get the second derivative of u you remember this is what numero needs isn't that numero needs this function that is being multiplied with u okay so to remind you of this let let me go back to numero algorithm so numero algorithm here yes so numero algorithm uh, x double prime of t is f of t times x of t so we need this function f of t which is multiplied with x in order to get a second derivative, isn't it? So we need this function. So and in, in case of Schrodinger equation, this function is given by whatever is in the brackets, okay? So this function is now implemented here into F Schrodinger. So it's LL plus one divided by R square, LL plus one divided by R, but then there is one more divided by R, which is R square plus U consham minus EN. So I, I was careful here to divide uh, to divide this sum with R because this gives you less numerical error than if you divide the first term by R square and the second one divide by R. So this is kind of more careful way to do to do the through derivatives because there is some subtraction between the two uh, u consham uh, and L plus one divided by R because the first term is always positive, the second term is always negative. So the, the two subtract. It's not so um, important because the subtraction is not so perfect, but nevertheless, this is a more careful way of implementing um, uh, implementing this, uh, this f function. Okay, so then this f function will give us what numero needs to solve Schrodinger equation. Okay, and then we can solve Schrodinger equation by numero algorithm just like before. Okay, so in numero algorithm, the first uh, input is the function f, okay, that we just evaluated. So the function f here, we call f Schrodinger that we just implemented above, uh, needs as an input the energy of the bound state, L. Then it needs R uh, and the current approximation for uh, this constant potential. But notice that there is this minus one here. So if you remember, this minus one means that we are we are uh, turning around the uh, uh, the mesh for R and the mesh for constant potential. So this turning around it's very important because that means that we are starting in start integrating in infinity rather than zero. So we are start we start integrating at infinity and we go down uh, in in terms of R. So we are integrating in the more um, stable direction. So we remember that start, if you start integrating Schrodinger equation from zero to large r, this will never work. We need to start at large r and go down to zero. And that's what we are doing here. So we are turning around the mesh and we have to turn out, of course, uh, the potential. We need to turn, turn around both and then we actually uh, integrate from infinity down to zero. And now this f is properly turned around, then we can give this to numero 
with proper boundary condition. So the value of the solution, Schrodinger equation, the, of the solution for the Schrodinger equation at zero is zero. And the derivative has to be some small number, which is not so important what it is, but it has to be some small number. Uh, then uh, then uh, R0 minus R1 is just the, the split, the small step in, uh, on the mesh. Uh, and then once we get the numeral solution, we have to turn it around because we want to have solution of the Schrodinger equation on the original mesh R, not the, the one that is turned around, doesn't it? From, from infinity down to zero. So once we have the solution of the Schrodinger equation, we then can normalize it with the Simpson's method. So Simpson's method just integrates and make sure that, uh, that the uh, integral of u square is equal to one. So we are divide here by the uh, square root of the norm, uh, which makes sure that the, that the solution is now properly normalized. And the reason for this is because uh, we start with an arbitrary uh, derivative uh, in infinity. We don't fine tune the derivative. Therefore, we don't know what the, what the normalization of the function is gonna be. And we normalize the function at the, at the very end. Okay, so this is the same as before uh, in, when we were doing, uh, when we were solving the hydrogen atom with the only difference now that we need to properly insert the constant potential, which is self-consistent. Okay, otherwise the algorithm is the same. Of course, you need to be make, sh make sure that we turn around properly constant potential uh, 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 that, that it's given in, in, uh, in, proper, in proper mesh. Okay, uh, once we define this compute Schrodinger equation, uh, we can of course also compute, uh, we can also shoot in exactly the same way as before. The only difference again is that uh, shooting method needs to call correct um, function compute Schrodinger equation, which gives uh, uh, the, the current self consistent potential UKS. So, shooting method uh, takes as an input the uh, uh, current uh, constant potential uh, and then gives to compute Schrodinger the current constant potential and then uh, extrapolates, um, extrapolates the solution to zero in the best possible way. And as, you, as we discussed last time, we could use a uh, linear interpolation, uh, which is implemented here actually on top, but this linear interpolation is not so precise. Uh, if, we use, um, uh, if we use this uh, sky p poly fit, basically it fits the polynomial. In this case, we ask for the polynomial of the degree three. So it's the cubic parabola. Uh, which is uh, which is obtained by the last four points on the mesh. So we take the last four points uh, of the solution, we uh, fit through the polynomial of third order, and then we use this polynomial fit uh, to estimate to extrapolate uh, to the value at zero. Okay, and um, well, this uh, can be used then for our shooting of the uh, uh, shooting method in uh, solving the um, Schrodinger equation. Okay, so uh, now the only thing that's left here is to find all the bound states. And again, the finding the bound states uh, is basically exactly the same as in the hydrogen atom. There is no, there is not, not much more than just uh, uh, calling uh, different uh, different uh, 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 Schrodinger equation solver. So, for example, um, when we uh, optimize, uh, uh, when when we find uh, when we look for the zero, we need to call proper shooting routine, which has um, the extra arguments. Here, the extra arguments are R, L, and U constant. So R, L, and U constant, isn't that? So we have to specify this extra arguments which corresponds to our current shooting method. So that's all there is to it. Otherwise it's basically identical implementation than in the hydrogen atom. Um, and we, we store in exactly the same way, we store L and the energy of, the, of each bound state. And we um, go through, um, uh, go through, 
a mesh e search which is which should should not be too dense neither too um uh neither uh, neither too um uh, um uh, too sparse so that um we bracket all zeros or bound states that are necessary for the solution of, of our problem. Okay, so we have this uh, uh, this method now for finding the bound states, and now it's time to uh, to check how it works. So we are going to go now for over all uh, L up to n max minus one. Um, uh, I don't know what n max is, but probably three in this case. Uh, and we are going to find uh, all the bound states that are that are necessary, for example, for uh, hydrogen. Now, of course, we are using now um, charge density from the hydrogen like solution, isn't it? So and indeed, we found several bound states. Um, the first bound state is not at minus one as for the expected for the hydrogen, but it's at minus 0.6. And the reason for this again is because we added the Hartree potential and exchange correlation potential into our solution of the uh, of the Schrodinger equation, isn't it? So these bound states now are not anymore similar, very close to hydrogen problem, because otherwise the first one should be at minus one, and next one should be at minus one quarter. Okay, you what you also see is that the gener the generacy uh, is lifted. Okay, so. Um, these uh, in hydrogen atom, uh, all these energies, uh, well, many of those energies were uh, degenerate. And we had to uh, be very, very careful when we sorted them. Now, once we add the interaction between electrons, there is no accidental degeneracy anymore. All the genesis are lifted. And so the sorting in some sense is simpler. Okay, so. Uh, we managed to then get all the bound states. Uh, and uh, then if we have the bound states, we can calculate, uh, we can recalculate the charge density, isn't it? And the charge density, again, is calculated in exactly the same way as in the hydrogen problem. So uh, this is the function for the charge density, for calculating charge density. And again, uh, the only difference here is that we need to call correct solver for the Schrodinger equation, isn't it? So given the energy, uh, so we, we iterate over the bound states uh, and we take for each bound, from each bound state, we take its L, which is the orbital quantum number and energy. And given orbital quantum number L and energy, we should use the new uh, function for compute Schrodinger equation, which uses current uh, Kornstrom potential. So if you properly uh, uh, give the Kornstrom potential to the uh, Schrodinger equation solver, we get a solution for um, a solution of the Schrodinger equation uh, with this particular um, potential. And then we sum uh, them up with uh, proper uh, degeneracy, which is uh, at most two times two L plus one. So sometimes we need to uh, populate, well, the last level, the last orbital might need to be populated with, with less than uh, two times two L plus one. And for this, we use so-called Fermi function. Okay, now one thing that is kind of uh, slightly different than in, uh, that in uh, uh, hydrogen atom solution is that we are saving not only the charge density, uh, but we're saving also the um, uh, sum of all eigenvalues, okay? So uh, look, uh, we are adding here to the charge density, u square times Fermi function times proper degeneracy divided by four pi r square, okay? That's what needs to be added to the charge density, rho is rho plus d rho. But then we also save EBS, which is the sum of all uh, bound state energies, okay? Which is uh, En, which is the current, uh, current um, 
bound state energy times its degeneracy times Fermi function. Okay. So it, it, as it will turn out, this is uh, this is what we need to calculate total energy. So this is an important important uh, constituent uh, uh, or quantity which is needed to calculate the total energy of the system. Okay. So therefore, I decided to insert this this line here. Okay. So basically, sum of all um, of all um, uh, bound state energies. Okay, so we are we are we are going to print it exactly the same way as before. So the current L, the total, yeah. So here we are actually printing uh, the the uh, energy of the bound state divided by two, which is uh, energy of the bound state in in Hartree's, adding state uh, in Hartree's uh, with a Fermi function. So I'm dividing here by two, so that the energies are given in Hartree's. And the reason for this is because we are going to compare this with, uh, uh, with the NIST database. And in this database, everything is in Hartree's, not in Rydberg's. Okay? So we might get confused otherwise, because the numbers will not, work, will not, will not be one to one. In that. So there is this factor of two. Because chemists always use Hartree's, and physicists always use Rydberg's. And the, the, there is always a constant confusion between the, between the two units. OK. So this is the charge density. So now I can use uh, this function charge density on current bound states, R, Z, and potential uh, to recalculate uh, the, the, new, uh, the new charge density and get the uh, bound state, the sum of all the bound state energies, okay? Of all the energies of the bound states. Okay, so now that I have new charge density, I can use this in the next step to improve uh, the punch constant potential, isn't it? And then I can do the circle system many, many, many times. Uh, now, this um, if I just use the new charge density again in the same iteration process, the uh, I will probably not be able to converge the solution, it turns out. Um, so the minimum thing that is necessary here is some mixing. So namely, if we had mix roughly 50% of the, of the previous solution and 50% of the new solution, and then make um, evaluate, uh, evaluate the Schrodinger equation on this 50-50 mixture, then the, uh, the iteration will probably work. So this amount of admixing of how much you need to admix of the new charge density to the old charge density before you iterate um, is a, a tricky question in the sense that if the, um, if the solution is very attractive, then you might just use 100% of the new charge density. Now, if the solution is kind of not very attractive, you're kind of not really close to this, uh, uh, to the region where the solution becomes attractive. You might need need to, you might need to use very very small admixing parameter. Um, in the uh, in solids, for example, it's not unusual to use admixing parameter of the order of 0.1 or sometimes even 0.01 in order to get convergence. Uh, of course, that requires uh, way more iterations, uh, many more iterations, and that's that. Therefore, it might be expensive. Uh, for the atom, it turns out the 50-50 uh, uh, mixing is is working works in most cases. Um, in which case, the we we just need to, uh, maybe 10 or 20 steps, so it's not that expensive. Now, if it turns out that this um, uh, mixing uh, needs to be very small uh, to reach the circle systems a solution, mm -hmm. which means that the uh, the problem uh, is highly nonlinear and not well posed, or it's not the solution is not very attractive. Uh, it's a good idea to use more advanced uh, type of um, uh, of uh, mixing, namely Broiden mixing. Okay, so. Uh, there is a well-known uh, method 
called Broiden method, which uses uh, previous uh, iteration steps to try to estimate uh, the derivative of the of the function derivative, basically the Jacobian of the charge density. Uh, so we then we use not only the previous charge density, but also the Jacobian uh, from previous information to uh, use kind of Newton-like method for iteration. So we are right now we are using just a simple iterative procedure, but if this simple iterative procedure doesn't work, we might need to use more advanced uh, methods such as the Broiden's method. I'm not going to go into details about Broiden because this itself is like a uh, complicated uh, numerical procedure. Um, but it's it's good idea to keep in mind that if simple iteration doesn't work, you might need to uh, uh, search for the Broiden method. OK, so um, now we are almost uh, ready to put um, everything together so we need to now iterate uh step one to step five until self-consistency is achieved so uh step five is admixing the the new and the old charge density step four was computing the new electron density step three was finding bound states using hard three uh current hard and exchange correlation potential step two was computing the exchange correlation potential and step one was um calculating this f function for the uh, for the heart rate potential okay so uh, we just need to iterate this and um, we are gonna uh, check our implementation with a benchmark at nist web page so if we go um, if we click on this link at the very top there is a link to nist uh, database we click here, then we get um, we get uh, okay. So we get this atomic reference data for electronic structure calculations, uh, atomic total energies and eigenvalues, and now I can scroll to uh, any atom in the periodic table. I can click on it and I can get um, the reference data. So currently, my hope is to do this. Um, well, I'm currently coding this for oxygen. So let me check for oxygen. I click on it, and I get the following. So oxygen, oxygen has eight electrons. Uh, it's it has uh, helium, which is one s uh, doubly occupied. So two s state is doubly occupied, and two p state has four electrons. Like that. And then uh, it gives a total energy now uh, this is not specified here but i know that this total energy is given in heart trees and is minus 74.473077 heart tree okay then there is they split this into kinetic energy and the coulomb energy uh, by the way kinetic energy is almost twice the coulomb energy um, this uh, comes uh, this factor of two comes from the viral theorem if this was exact then there should be exact effect of two between the two. Um, then there is a nuclear energy, which is basically the energy between the nucleus and uh, and the electron of the, the energy due to interact uh, due to uh, interaction between nucleus and the, and the, um, uh, and the electrons. Then they they separately quote the exchange correlation part uh, of the energy, uh, and then here they give. Uh, the um, energy of the all three bound states 1s 2s and 3s uh, 1s 2s and 2p actually sorry in this case so uh, we can compare all those quantities we have all of those we have all the bound states doesn't it we have the total energy uh, i'm not printing right, right now kinetic energy and exchange correlation energy separately but we easily could because we have all these quantities and we could compare every quantity so when you're debugging your code and you don't know what what's what's go, what's wrong. You can compare any quantity from from this database, and uh, you have to look into the LDA potential and LDA results, doesn't it? LDA results. This is what we're what we're doing, what we're currently doing. Okay, so um, that's what we need to 
get. That's our ultimate goal. Um, so self-consistent thing. Uh, well, but currently I didn't yet explain uh, how to calculate total energy. Um, so we have, if we, if we um, start to self-consist, we're gonna get self-consistent charge density, but we are not yet gonna have total energy, okay? So in order to calculate total energy, we need to insert a step, another step between step four and step five, which will basically post-process or use the quantities that we already calculated to, to add uh, another quantity, which is total energy. And it turns out that it's more convenient to, um, uh, to check the convergence of the total energy uh, rather than the charge density. So uh, it's kind of easier to, uh, to check whether total energy converges and then the charge density is usually converged too. Okay, so what's the total energy? Um, well, um, we, need to be we need to be careful here because we need to calculate total energy of the interacting problem, not of the non-interacting problem, okay? So naively, total energy would be just kinetic energy plus potential energy, which would be uh, just uh, the total V hard three potential times charge density rho d rho. But that would be wrong in this case because actually this is uh, an interacting problem. So we need to be a bit more careful when we calculate the total energy. Of course, the exact prescription uh, was given by uh, Walter Kohn's uh, 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 work on DFT. So this is actually DFT energy. Um, and uh, we need to use that, Walter Kohn's uh, uh, expression, which, is, uh, which in some sense is completely, uh, completely obvious, but let me explain it. So um, the kinetic energy, is of course the kinetic, kinetic energy that corresponds to our charge density right now, isn't it? So this is how you calculate the kinetic energy uh, for non-interacting particles, but this is also the same expression that we use for so-called Kohn-Sham particles, okay? So when, we, when Walter Kohn derived his work, he introduced these Kohn-Sham orbitals um, in such a way that the kinetic energy had exactly the same expression as in the non-interacting problem, okay? This was, this was actually a definition for the quantum orbitals, okay? So that comes from the definition of quantum orbitals that the kinetic energy has the same expression in the non-interacting problem and in the interacting problem, okay? So now, what about the other terms? Well, the next term is the, the interaction between nuclei and the charge density. And again, in this case, uh, it's completely um, obvious expression. You need to uh, uh, multiply the charge density times um, uh, interaction uh, between nuclei and, and, and charge, which is uh, V nucleo nucleus is uh, minus 2Z divided by R, isn't it? Okay. So it's basically electrostatics, minus 2Z divided by R uh, times the charge density. So these, the, these two are completely obvious and they, they, are still, they have, still have non-interacting form. Okay, so the first two terms have the same form as in the non-interacting problem. No uh, uh, surprise up to now. Now, the only thing that one that's kind of, the, where one needs to be a little bit more careful is that for the hard to exchange correlation potential, we should not use here uh, uh, um, potential V, but rather energy density E, okay? So energy density is not the same as the potential, okay? So energy density E Hartree, as we will see, is only one half of the potential and exchange correlation, basically this one half comes from viral theorem, uh, while exchange correlation is not one half of V exchange correlation, but it's an arbitrary function. We don't know, we don't have a precise relation between uh, v exchange correlation and E exchange correlation, okay? So we need to use E exchange correlation in this expression, not V, okay? That's all. So this is kind of completely, uh, in some sense, completely obvious. So these quantities are called energy densities, energy density. So clearly we need to 
take energy density, multiply with the charge density to get the contribution to the total energy, doesn't it? And then we integrate this over the space. So once more, we take the energy density, we multiply this with the charge density, which gives you contribution to the total energy in this particular point in space, and we just integrate over the entire space. Okay, so up to now, this total energy, I think it's completely plausible expression for total energy. And that's what comes out of the, of the density functional theory by uh, Walter Kohn. Uh, we didn't derive it here, but I mean, it's, 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 pretty, um, it's pretty simple, uh, simple thing to see that this is, this is the right expression. Okay. Um, so uh, now the question is, how are, how are these uh, energy densities related to the quantities that we, uh, that we uh, deal with up to now. Um, well, the energy density, the heart rate energy density is something that we can definitely uh, exactly calculate because the heart rate term is the classical term. You should be able to do that. The exchange correlation part is uh, a little bit more tricky. Uh, the people have done it for us. Basically they, um, integrated the expression for the for the weak heart rate um, and uh, we're just going to use that uh, this implementation okay but before before we do that let's let's see how this is uh, uh, done in practice so we are not gonna uh, calculate nabla square uh, on uh, the wave function because that's kind of um, inconvenient or hard uh, so th there is a standard trick. So we um, add together all the terms that enter the Schrodinger equation, and then we uh, subtract them later on. So we add and subtract in such a way that what that the terms in this bracket are exactly those that enter the Schrodinger equation. Okay. So minus nabla square plus v nucleus plus v factor plus exchange, exchange correlation potential. This is what gives you what, what, what has to be applied to psi in order to get the bound state energy, isn't it? So basically this expression here, minus nabla square plus v nucleus plus v factor plus v exchange correlation on psi gives you the bound state energy times psi, okay? And now you see why we needed bound state energies, okay? Because this expression here, the entire, this, the entire line here is basically just equal to the bound state energy epsilon i, okay? Once more, because this operator here is the operator that enters the Schrodinger equation. When applied to psi, it gives you ei energy, isn't it? Time psi, but the psi's are normalized to unity. Therefore, um, therefore, this first term is basically just the energy of the occupied state. Okay, um, of the bound state. So this term we already uh, evaluated. Now uh, what's left here is we added to e hard three and exchange correlation potential. We subtract, we added here minus v hard three and minus v exchange correlation because we added them here. We had to subtract it down here, doesn't it? Okay, so we added and subtracted v hard three exchange correlation potential in such a way. That, uh, that, that this part here corresponds exactly to what enters the Schrodinger equation. Okay, so now we are left here with simple three-dimensional integral. And well, moreover, in our particular atomic problem, everything is spherical symmetric. So basically three-dimensional integral is actually just a one-dimensional integral, okay? Because it's, uh, we are left, the, the, the integration is only or the radial distance r. So this is a simple problem then anymore. So uh, what we're left with, with is then uh, sum over all occupied energy energies plus this integral. Um, now there is one more step. Yeah, so here I just, just copied the heart three minus weak heart three exchange correlation minus weak exchange correlation potential. Now um, we, can, we can make one more simplification uh, to find the relation between E heart tree and V heart tree, okay? So it turns out that the heart rate energy and the potential, the energy density 
and the potential for the heart rate are simply related by factor one half. Okay, so how do you how do you see that? Well, here is the expression. So this generic expression um, for the energy density and the energy uh, is of course completely completely um, general or, or universal. Okay, so this this y here stands for either heart rate or exchange correlation. Okay, so look at this expression. This expression says that if we have the total energy, either heart rate exchange correlation or any any type of energy, which can be which can be written as an integral or the three D space of rho of r times e uh, small e uh, of rho of r, then this small e here is is the energy density. That's exactly the definition for the energy density, isn't it? Okay, so energy density times the density, you integrate over the space and you get the expression for total energy, isn't it? So in other words, this is just definition of the energy density. Well, if this is correct, then the functional derivative of the energy with respect to the charge rho has to give you then potential energy, okay? So that's the definition for the potential. So pot potential is the functional derivative of this expression with respect to rho. Okay, so these are the two equations that you need to know. And once you know those two, then for the heart rate potential, where we know the functional form of the energy, uh, we can uh, we can get both the uh, we, we can get the relation between the, uh, the potential and energy density. Okay, so. I guess this this is this is kind of obvious, but let me sketch it here. So, um, for a heart rate potential, we said that we heart that we said that E as the energy heart rate is equal to uh, integral rho of r rho of r prime divided by uh, r minus r prime d to the three r d to the three r prime. Is that so um, usually we write here one half, but uh, now in our units, the Coulomb interaction is two over R. And then this exactly um, cancels this factor of one half here. So in readworks, this is correct expression. Okay, so this is, this is E heart rate. And then um, of course, by just looking at this expression, we can immediately say that E, um, that energy density of R is whatever needs to be multiplied um, with rho of r to get uh, to get uh, to get to get uh, the the energy, isn't it? So therefore, uh, E heart rate is the is the green thing. Okay, so E heart rate is uh, rho of r prime divided by r minus r prime d to the three r prime. Okay, obviously, because, because E heart rate needs to be energy density times rho of r d to the three r. That's the definition. Okay, so, but on the other hand, we said that um, potential V heart rate of r is functional derivative of the total density uh, of the total. Uh, uh, total energy expression with respect to uh, the recharge. Okay, that's another definition. Okay, now if I do this on, uh, if I do this on this functional, what do I get? Well, now I need to know how to take the derivatives. And as you were told in uh, high school, uh, if you have, uh, if rho appears twice, if rho is a quadratic function um, of, um, of energy, then you get factor of two, isn't it? So basically I'm gonna get rho of r prime divided by r minus r prime, but because rho appears twice in this equation, I will get, I will get factor of two here, okay? Again, factor of two here is very simply because 
rho appears twice in uh, in the energy functional. Okay, and now you can see clearly that um, that E hard three of R is uh, is one half of V hard three of R. Okay, so I'm comparing I'm comparing this expression. I'm comparing this expression. Uh, something better. So I'm comparing this expression with that expression, isn't it? And I see that E hard three is one half of V hard three. Okay. I guess it's an obvious thing, but um, still I wanted to derive it here. Um, so I derived here this E hard three is one half V hard three, isn't it? But as we had we said before, we are actually we are not using V hard three. We are using an expression which we call U divided by R because this is more convenient for solving the Schrodinger equation. Um, and then um, yeah, so this is for E hard three. Uh, and uh, then what about the exchange correlation part? Well, for the exchange correlation part, the expression is not so simple. So uh, when it comes to exchange correlation potential, uh, E exchange correlation, we don't have a simple form in terms of rho density, of rho. So we know that this is rho R times E. Uh, no, actually, I'm, I'm talking about the correlation part. Exchange, yeah, well, no, bo both of them. Well, exchange is simple, I think. But still, both exchange correlation part uh, have the following form, E exchange correlation, which depends on rho, which depends on R, okay? D to the three R. And so the point is that this functional form here, it's not simple. It's not linear in rho. So for the hard three part, we know that this thing is actually a um, simple function of rho. I mean, you just, you just uh, look upstairs in a definition uh, and you will see that this is a simple function of rho. But uh, for, the, for the exchange correlation part, it's hi some highly nonlinear um, function of rho. We don't know it. Okay. So therefore, when people um, uh, fit, uh, will, will pe people fit uh, V exchange correlation as a function of rho, they need to calculate then, uh, they need to calculate E exchange correlation as a function of rho in such a way. So these two need to be related in such a way that V exchange correlation of rho is given as proper functional derivative with respect to rho. So basically of this expression, rho of R uh, times, um, so rho of R times epsilon E exchange correlation of rho of R, D to the three R. Isn't it? So because this expression here is exactly the, tot the total energy. And when you take the functional derivative with respect to rho, you should get exchange correlation of rho. Okay, so when people were doing this one dimensional fit, they had to make sure that there is proper, um, there is proper relation between uh, exchange correlation density and exchange correlation potential. Okay, and this uh, relation is highly non-trivial. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's some, uh, some complicated um, uh, functions. Okay, but uh, hopefully this, uh, uh, well, uh, this uh, relation has been coded and it exists, so we can just use it. Um, and all that we need to do here is we need to implement then this formula, okay? This formula, we need to insert that formula. Okay, so, um, now I think this part is what's being given to you for the homework. Okay, so uh, now I guess it's a good idea to listen. Um, uh, but uh, I don't know if you're going to able to finish today. Maybe next time. Um, so you need you need to put all these things together properly, so that uh, uh, so that it gives correct uh, total energy and uh, works surface gives you surfaces and solution. Okay, so um, uh, the first thing that we need to be a bit, bit careful is to um, uh, have a good mesh 
to search for uh, bound states. In the hydrogen atom, I don't know whether we tune this uh, 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 more precisely. I mean, if, if you don't get the bound states with roughly correct, with correct energy splittings, then you might need to use a different uh, uh, set of points uh, or, or mesh for, for this uh, search for the bound states. Now, um, oops, Z atom. Uh, let's say Z atom is eight. Okay, so what I used here is uh, is logarithmic mesh. Um, logarithmic mesh such that it's very, very dense, uh, uh, close to zero, uh, and much less dense, of course, uh, uh, at uh, very, very, uh, uh, um, very deep. Uh, we, we need to start uh, search um, around z atom square, actually minus one half, minus 1.2 z atom square. We started the search in the same way in um, hydrogen atom. So we start ser for searching for the bound states very, very deep so that we make sure that we don't miss any bound state. And then uh, we, uh, before we end up uh, at zero with very dense mesh around zero. But it turns out that when you do the self-consistent iterations, it turns out that sometimes the bound state energies can become slightly positive. Okay, because of numerics, it turns out that it happens sometimes that the bound states uh, during iterations become slightly positive. And if you don't have slight, if you don't allow for this, if you don't search for the for the for the bound states even slightly on a positive energy, you might miss sometimes the bound state. So therefore, I tune this expression in such a way that the very dense mesh is not exactly at zero, but it's slightly shifted above zero. So if you if you search, if you show here the zoom in uh, between uh, y is minus one and one, you see that this actually goes to towards positive energy, positive 0.5. I mean, this positive number is not important. It can be 0 0.1, 0 0.2, it doesn't matter. Because we are gonna, we need to find all our bound states uh, here below zero or slightly above zero. Okay, not far above zero. Okay, because there are bound states should should occur at negative energies. Now it turns out that due to numerics, sometimes can slightly change to a positive energy, and if you don't allow for that, the self-consistency might fail. So this is a bit tricky thing. So you need to be, you need to, you need to tweak uh, this uh, uh, e-search uh, algorithm uh, so it doesn't fail. Uh, maybe the original one from the hydrogen atom will work, but I think I, I had to change it at, at some point to uh, uh, so this was more robust for heavier atoms. Um, yeah. So this is one trick that uh, that uh, I need to explain. And then the rest is basically here, but the time is already 6.20, so I guess I'm going to stop here. And I'm going to discuss next time the precise solution for the, uh, for the uh, LDA uh, in, for the generic atom. And this is what you're going to have for the homework. Okay, So next time I'm going to discuss this, and then you're going to have still uh, one week for the homework. Okay, any question? Is there any question? No? Everything was understood? Uh, let me stop. Uh, stop. I have a question. Yep. Um, we're using for our mesh 